Good morning. It's so, it's so beautiful, like an interlude before preaching. I, I love that. It is, it is a joy. It's really a joy to be with you here uh, this morning to talk about things being a hot mess. And of course, when there was an opportunity to preach about being a hot mess, I was so deeply grateful to be considered as somewhat of an expert on the topic, <laughs> or at least enough so <laughs> to be invited to preach about it uh, for you here this morning. And I'm just here to continue a conversation about the messiness of our faith, the messiness of our world, the messiness of our call to join God in God's work in the world as co-workers, as servants. And as you've been seeing throughout this series, the church is messy, relationships are messy, and additionally, serving is messy. It's messy because of what we step into as we serve, but it's also quite messy because of who we are and what we bring as we serve others. And before we jump in, I, I, I know that some of you don't know much about me, or maybe the things that you have heard about me are just untrue. Um, <laughs> or maybe you know some things about Hope Springs, but uh, are, are maybe new to the church or haven't heard about us in a while. And so I'm going to try to share some stories along the way um, about those things. But so you can just know a little bit more about me. I, I've served in ministry work here in Baltimore for the last uh, 11 years now almost. And uh, what brought me here to, the, to Baltimore was to help to plant a new church. I was a part of a team that was planting what became the Gallery Church in Baltimore. Um, served on staff there in a variety of ways, leading music, leading our staff team. Um, I was an executive pastor for a while, and then, and then serving as neighborhood pastor at Gallery Church Patterson Park for a number of years. And, and a few years ago, there was this stirring that I started to feel uh, towards something something different. I couldn't quite put my finger on it, and maybe you've been in a similar situation before, but there was this growing passion in me to see the church, the capital C church, all the people who claim Jesus and seek to follow him, to be more united together regionally, particularly in service. And my heart for the city has grown, and so has my passion for seeing the faith community work together actually leaning in to its call to love God and to love neighbor, to love our actual neighbors, whomever they may be. And so this led me eventually to join up with the work at Hope Springs, an organization that was partnering with churches all over Baltimore to better love and serve for those who've been living with HIV. And I had seen this happen. Our church had partnered with Hope Springs in a variety of ways. I had served as a volunteer and as a church leader, uh, church liaison there, and was able to join the team over two years ago and worked for the Aaron Donovan. Uh, yeah, you got a woo. That's great. It was one woo, I heard. It was a good woo. Um, before she recently transitioned out of a long and formidable tenure as executive director. Um, and I was eventually invited um, in that time of transition to, to serve as the next executive director. And it's been such a wonderful and wild ride. And it's one that I feel like I'm just now starting. And we at Hope Springs believe that there is power in the church. But as wise Uncle Ben once told a young Peter Parker, with great power comes great, thank you, fellow comic nerds, I really appreciate that. Um, I'm a child of the church. My dad is a Baptist pastor. Um, on my mom's side of the family, uh, my grandfather, who is now 86 years old and still serving as interim pastors, and he stays way too long because he's too good at it. Um, I, I, that's a part of my story. I was raised in the church, and as a result of that, I have experienced that the power of the church. But power isn't always necessarily like a good word. Sometimes we think of things being powerful as good things, uh, even though it was for me. Power of community, power of support, great relationships, uh, especially when you walk through troubling things. But there was also this capacity for the church to, to not be so supportive. Um, I'd seen sort of the ugly white underbelly of the church. I've experienced pain, betrayal, disappointment, disillusionment, toxic relationships. Some of you may already be thinking, as I'm talking about my story, of your own past experiences with the church that sort of uh, helped to illuminate the fact that this, this church 
that we are a part of has capacity, it has power, but it has capacity to bring both hope and harm. There's a small comfort available to us today that this capacity for hope or for harm is not a new phenomenon in the church. It's been something we've been struggling with from the beginning, which brings us to our text today, and it also names what we bring to our text today as well. So what I wanted to do, um, we're going to read the text through together. If you'll indulge me and stand um, as we read um, from the scriptures from 1 Corinthians 8, um, we're going to be in chap- uh, at chapter 8, verse 1 through 13, and I'll read it for us, and then we'll just talk a little bit about it. Now, about food sacrificed to idols, we know that, quote, we all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know, but whoever loves God is known by God. So then, about eating food sacrificed to idols, we know that, quote, an idol is nothing at all in the world and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father from whom all things came and for whom we live, and there is one, but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. But not everyone possesses this knowledge. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat sacrificial food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to a god, and since their conscience is weak, it's defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We're no worse if we do not eat. We're better if we do. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For someone with a weak conscience sees you with all your knowledge eating in an idol's temple. Won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. And when you sin against them in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause them to fall. The word of the Lord. You can be seated. So as we've seen, this this church, this community in Corinth is a community in conflict, a hot mess. And our text shows us another dimension of this messiness. There's this conflict going on having to do with issues surrounding eating meat, which has been offered to idols. Now, it can be challenging for us to connect with texts like this, right? Like our society is not set up like this. We don't have cultic feasts where meat is sacrificed to idols at parties, and then we're invited to eat it. And if you do that, I would like to talk with you um, about what is your life. Um, Even in my Bible, the heading says, quote, concerning food sacrificed to idols. And my first thought was, I'm not really concerned about that. (laughs) Um, Yet there might be more for us here than we think. In this community, there was a certain elite group of people who thought they had all the answers, including answers for another group of people. These were elite socialites who had access to significant people and were invited to these high-class events. And they weren't concerned with what they were eating or drinking because they had a good theological and philosophical reason, a system, to back up their behavior. It wasn't an issue. And I don't know about you, but I identify with this right away because there is a certain comfort and pride in thinking or knowing that we're right and others are wrong. Paul is quoting the Corinthians back to themselves here. When you see quotes like that, Uh, in some of your translations. It's an attempt to show where Paul's sort of in dialogue with these Corinthians. Uh, They've written to him, and these are common phrases that that were around in the community. These quotes, we know that we possess all knowledge. (laughs) Okay, we all have friends like this, right? (laughs) Some of you are that friend, (laughs) and your, your friend status is in jeopardy because you are what I like to call well actually sort of friends. Well actually friends, right? Well actually we possess all knowledge, right? This is basically every college freshman that's taken a philosophy course, or if you're like me, a Bible college student who's taken one theology course and now can explain finally how predestination works. You're welcome. Paul takes this down with just one phrase. I love this. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Knowing the right answers is not what love is about. 
telling people the right answers is not what service is about. It is not a service to them. Let me put it more directly. Knowing or even being aware of something doesn't equal love. Knowing or being aware of something doesn't equal service. Can I tell you, this is a hard lesson for me to learn. One I continue to learn again and again. I moved to Baltimore with all the certainty and pride that accompany college graduates. I had the expectation that everyone was waiting for me to deliver truth to them, finally. I mean, I graduated with honors. I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> I read the books, right? I listened to the podcast. I, I watched The Wire before I moved to Baltimore. <laughs> I had knowledge. <laughs> but what's followed for me have been years of just this reprogramming of my knowledge base puffed up posture. I'm learning something really simple and basic. And I don't know if it was left out of my curriculum or if it was just something that I wasn't ready to learn yet. It's just about how to be a decent human being, how to listen to someone, how to see how God might be already at work in their life. That for me is going to be a lifelong endeavor of trying to do that because, oh, how we love knowledge. And we spend so much time going after it. Honestly, it's a part of our work at Hope Springs, too. We say that it's our job to awaken others to the reality of HIV, of related health disparities here. And a lot of the work we do is raising awareness, which often just feels like giving away more knowledge. You know, and I could stand up here and I could tell you that one in 41 people are living with HIV here in Baltimore City. I could tell you that. I could also tell you that 50% of people who are living with HIV right now are 50 years and older for the first time ever in the history of the epidemic. People are living longer with HIV, but it means there are further complications. How do we care well for them? What does it look like for them to be in assisted living facilities as they age and need more help? And how do we continue to serve them well? I could could tell you that. (laughs) I could tell you a lot of other stats and statistics and demographic, uh, demographic issues, and all of these sort of things. And I could hope that because you have more knowledge, that you now have what you need to act in love and to serve. I could hope for that. But my fear is that there's a comfort in knowing more about something, that there's comfort there, and now I know more, that doesn't really propel us into service. My fear is that we're about knowing more rather than attending to love. And so I could instead just tell you about a friend named Jason. Jason, we'll call him Jason. Jason, he's a very gifted young black man I met in an event that we were both at together and got to learn some of his story. He uh, was raised in the church much like I did. We had a lot in common as we first started talking to one another. Raised in the church, his father is a minister. He was in the church every night of the week. Knew his scriptures backward and backwards and forwards. Um, he was kind of the de facto youth minister because all the kids looked up to him. And um, there was this challenge that he began to face as he started to struggle with this reality around his sexual orientation. He started to discover that he was actually attracted to other men. And there was no framework in his faith community to talk about this. It was only brought up occasionally, usually scriptures that were quoted with the word abomination, which sounded like a really scary word, and he didn't know what to do with that, and he couldn't talk to his parents about that. And so he found himself drifting from the church, and early on in his life, he discovered that uh, he had contracted HIV, that he Uh, He ended up working for an organization at the time as well that was trying to serve other people. But this distance between his church and himself continued to grow. And he and I met each other in the hallway at this event, and uh, he he and I just started talking. And I saw with tears in his eyes this, this sense that I've lost community. And I'm, and I love Jesus. And I, I love the church of my youth, but I don't know how to exist there. I don't know how to build community. I'm afraid. I'm afraid to be vulnerable about who I am and what I've faced. And I just saw him with tears in his eyes telling me this story, and I I started thinking about this. 
about what does our knowledge do to prepare us to love Jason? Can, can Jason be just kind of one of the other statistics in the epidemic, someone who was at risk? You know, how do we, how do we really love and serve Jason and invite Jason to love and trust us? It starts to feel really messy right away because it is. But Jason is our brother. We expect knowledge to do a lot of work for us. But I suspect that knowledge can only take us so far, and it can often take us in the wrong direction. Paul is helping the church in Corinth who think that they've solved this community problem by thinking rightly about the issue. They've got quotes. Paul is saying that just because something is explained away by your theology doesn't mean that relationships are restored. That hasn't happened. It doesn't build up. It puffs you up. And actually, it could cause damage. At the start of the HIV epidemic, too many churches, particularly, if I can just say it, what it is, particularly majority white, affluent, and suburban churches, there were others as well either explained away or even ignored the HIV epidemic, and they did so on theological grounds, on scripture, quoting scripture along the way. They called this God's judgment. They blamed others for obviously sinning and contracting HIV. Friends, I still hear this in our work today. HIV is dismissed, and it's often not seen as relevant or important to the church. Hope Springs was started The way I like to talk about it is that it was started as a sort of collective act of repentance in light of this. I've learned from some of the key stakeholders who were there at the beginning of our organization, many of whom are are members here at Central. It was in response to some who had started to work collectively in HIV work overseas, and they were challenged by people there who they were serving with to consider their own context when they came back, asking, what's the deal with HIV where you live? One early stakeholder told me that the process which led to starting Hope Springs was about getting the church to respond and love those who were invisible. Those who were living with HIV were invisible to the church in their own communities. There were people who were invisible. This is what's happening in Corinth as well. Some people in the community were invisible to others, particularly those who had power and who had status. They weren't, but they weren't invisible to Paul. He had spent time with those coming out of this religious and cultural system, and and few of these people could even afford much of the meat of the elite were eating, uh, much less, uh, you know, consider what they do about eating or not eating, and so they were seeing others eat this meat, and it was doing something to them, and Paul got to know what that was like, these people that he called weaker, weaker conscience folks, which is not a pejorative term, by the way. He didn't consider them weak, Uh, It's just a way that he was talking about the different beliefs. They were being sinned against. And the Corinthian elites were ready to give those who had weaker consciences a theology lecture in lieu of adopting a personal diet change. Paul instead advocates for them, naming the hurt and pain that's being caused by other family members in the church. I love this example. It shows us this way that we can adopt a loving posture, one that seeks to build up others, not inflate ourselves. It leads us to even checking our own issues of conscience and the door, and don't worry, they'll be there for you at the door when you leave, and holding them loosely so we can attend to those and others. But he says something so interesting about this knowledge. He says, not everyone, not everyone possesses this knowledge that you have. In other words, not everyone has your experience of the world, Not everyone sees things the way you do. Shocking, right? Even more shocking is this. Paul's instruction is not not to now educate others so that they will hold to now your right perspective. It's to invite others to change, those who hold these views. It's an invitation to radically reconsider your own practices and posture toward them, even in unnecessarily restrictive ways, right? Paul's example, I'll never eat meat again. This is Paul's entire point. It's not about being right. It's not about convincing others that you're right. It's about laying down your rights and your right to be right for the sake of others. 
A friend of mine calls this posture compassionate curiosity. I really love that phrase, compassionate curiosity. It's a desire to better understand the person in front of you and to do so with a desire to feel what they feel alongside them, right? Compassion, to suffer with others. This means we hold our opinions more loosely than we hold our sisters and our brothers and our friends. We can adopt this posture because this is what love actually looks like. It's learning to see and learning to understand people who are invisible. And yet, what I believe Paul is saying here, amongst other things, is that there's actually no such thing as an invisible person. Let me explain what I mean by that. People cannot be not seen. People can be not understood. People can be not valued, not noticed. But a person is never invisible. They are simply unseen. Notice how this language can unintentionally betray our focus. If people are not seen, it's not because they are invisible, right? That has to do with them. But it's because we are blind. It's because we are aloof. It is because we are willfully ignorant. Paul is elevating our relationships to one another over these freedoms that we enjoy. Our bond in Christ, the fact that we're family to others who may hold different views than us about things, the fact that we are family with people who may actually be harmed by our views on things means that there is something far more important than being right or thinking that we're right. What is most important is our bond and our responsibility to others. That is what drives our service. This is why at Hope Springs, we made the decision not to call people that we serve clients. That doesn't name the right relationship for us. We call them siblings. We call them sisters. We call them brothers. There's a a dear brother and friend to me, um, a, a man who shares my name. Derek Spencer is his name. Uh, he has become uh, a occasional mentor to me when I can get coffee with him, and I bug him a lot for coffee. <laughs> um, but someone that I love to meet with when he, when he can spare the time, he's the former executive director of the Jocks Initiative uh, with University of Maryland. He's a nurse practitioner and someone who has just been a huge encouragement to me. And there was this phrase he used to always say when he, he would preach, and he's, uh, he's a kind of this, uh, he calls himself a black preacher boy, and he, he can preach uh, in ways that I dare not uh, tread. Um, but um, he always used to say this phrase, we need to put the we back in HIV. And not only does it sound like it rhymes, which is great, I think I'm starting to understand more of what this means for us as the body of Christ. The body of Christ has HIV. We have it. It's not something they have. It's not something others need to solve. It's not something that we discuss in hushed tones or whispers. It's not even something that simply, you know, is up to doctors or public health officials or federal workers to solve, even though they all have their role. Church, we are living with HIV because our family members are living with HIV. And that's messy. It's messy. But it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to serve. It's an opportunity to sacrifice our freedoms, our time, our schedules, our resources, our desire to want to figure it all out first to sacrifice our desire, to get others to believe what we believe, to to have others share our understanding of the world. We're to sacrifice all of those things for the sake of others. Serving is about what you do for the sake of others. Love always looks like something. For Paul, it looked like maybe never eating meat again in response to this challenge that his sisters and brothers were facing because that challenge was his challenge. Some of us might need to start a little bit smaller than that. Maybe just simply stepping into an environment that we don't control or lead to learn more, to listen to others. 
maybe uh, we need to recognize that we've had a lot of Bible studies and book studies, and that's great, and that's wonderful knowledge, but we have probably more knowledge than we could know how to obey right now. And we need to, for a season, set it to the, si- to the side so that we can invest in the lives of our sisters and brothers who are living with HIV. Some of you may just need to come with me to the next community meeting and listen to the stories and the passion and the example of those who have been working for decades in this epidemic and who inspire me every day because of the challenges that they overcome and how deeply they believe in their God. Maybe you just need to come with me. Some of you maybe have served in the past and maybe it didn't work out like you thought it would with Hope Springs. Maybe, maybe it failed. That's happened. And maybe it's time for you to, to step back in and say, I, I'm ready to try again. Maybe you got burned out. Maybe you got busy. Maybe you got hurt. I don't know what your story is, but I invite you to consider serving again. Service is being willing to adjust to the needs and perspectives of others for the sake of others, which makes it completely messy. But at Hope Springs, we believe that the call of the church is to continually place ourselves in the middle of this messy space to try to figure out what love looks like regarding our rights and our responsibilities to others. We believe that this is where God is active in the world and that this is what love looks like. Indeed, it's exactly what God's love looked like in Jesus. Jesus, who gave up everything, every privilege, every power, so that he could serve and love and save this world. Friends, I invite you, wherever you are in your life and whatever service looks like, to consider what it might look like to sacrifice something significant, to follow after Jesus for the sake of others, because you are bound to them in love.